The American Society of Human Genetics envisions a future where people everywhere realize the benefits of human genetics and genomics research. This year, we are excited to again bring you all the latest science in genetics and genomics, as well as insights on ASHG's diverse programs to unite and engage the community in new ways. This is the ASHG 2021 virtual meeting, and you're watching ASHG TV. Hello and welcome to our virtual ASHG TV studio and day one of our ASHG annual conference. The next few days will be filled with emerging science in genetics and genomics. We will also explore a broad range of topics important to the human genetics community. We find that genetic variation does influence COVID, both susceptibility and severity, that, that how, whether or not you're going to get infected and how bad your infection is. One of the major problems that we face in medicine is that some of it, be, you know, is trial and error. And so precision medicine helps to cut down on that trial and error aspects of, uh, of care. We are learning more and more about the genetic variants we have and being able to talk to patients, talk to the general public and impart our understanding of what genetics can and can't tell us is gonna be super, super important going forward. But first, let's hear from ASHG President Dr. Gail Jarvik about this year's virtual program and new ways for attendees to connect and network through the meeting. Welcome. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to ASHG 2021 Annual Meeting. I'd like to start by wishing you and your families my personal best for your health and your safety during this challenging time. We are looking forward to a great event full of emerging science professional development, and new, more expansive opportunities for networking and interaction. ASHG 2021 is hosted on a new platform this year, and it was designed for ease of use and also opportunities for social interactions. Attendees have access to video chat rooms, networking, career events throughout the whole week. Content can be personalized by the type, track, topic, and you can create an itinerary based on your individual interest. Additionally, all the content will be available on demand. Today will be a special day focused on posters with five sessions offered throughout the day with the authors being virtually present during specific time slots. And we're going to discuss the latest innovations in human genetics and genomics. In addition, we listen to your suggestions to increase the number of poster talks. Those will be available starting today on demand throughout the meeting. These rapid fire three minute talks are selected from the top scoring posters and have been programmed across all topics to allow a quick look at posters. While we can't be strolling through the exhibit hall eating candy, we will feature a showcase of industry and exhibitor partners and they'll be highlighting solutions for our community, demonstrating the latest advances for technology and tools to advance our science. The genetics industry is supported by a strong and dynamic base of commercial partners who contribute significantly to scientific progress and the success of the industry. I encourage you to stop by the showcase and watch for their events all week. I sincerely hope you enjoy the next four days of sessions and networking. Thank you for your participation. I'll see you online. Up next, we've got an interview with Dr. Benjamin Neal, an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and associate member in the Medical and Population Genetics Program of the Broad Institute, where we discuss how genetics and genomics became central to tackling the unprecedented global pandemic. First, though, let's head to the United Kingdom to look at the REACT study put together by Imperial College London and Ipsos Mori. The study gave government real-time insight into the prevalence of COVID-19 all across England. When the UK shut down its doors, public concern about COVID-19 went through the roof. Who was getting infected, how it was spreading through society, they were all unknowns. And that's why the REACT study was so important. The REACT study stands for Real-Time Assessment of Community Transmission. Imperial College London and Ipsos Mori were commissioned to make the data available to government, to the public and to the scientific community. What we wanted to know is what is the prevalence of this even in the asymptomatic population across the country. The REACT 1 study was an absolutely enormous job for Ipsos Mori, the largest single study we've, we've ever undertaken. We try and get the best overall estimate for the prevalence of people testing positive in England at any moment in time. 
you look at how that separates out by geography, by region, and then lots of other potential risk factors. The REACT study became incredibly important when governments were having to make very, very difficult choices. I don't think any data set this big with this much information has really ever existed before. It's really one of a kind. Novacyte Group is a global specialist in clinical diagnostics focused on the design, manufacture, and supply of oncology and infectious disease diagnostics products. The group were among the first to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, providing a rapid and reliable CE-marked COVID-19 test kit. Novacyte is a global developer and manufacturer of infectious disease clinical diagnostic kits. We were the first European manufacturer to actually develop a CE-marked uh, COVID-19 product. We have a full range of COVID-19 solutions from various technologies like PCR, lateral flow and ELISA that we can deploy easily for other infectious diseases. What makes these products unique is the highly advanced in silico analysis, which includes mutation modeling and analyzing sequence structures. All of this is the foundation of our molecular diagnostics. We developed one of the most comprehensive genome surveillance um, programs in the diagnostic industry. And to date, we've analyzed over 2 million sequences. What I'm excited about is being a part of the Novacyte family and legacy and the way that we can help to improve healthcare. Now let's go to Belgium to look at the Department of Human Genetics at KU Leuven and how they are applying genetic and genomic molecular and bioinformatic technologies to help improve our understanding of human disorders. The Department of Human Genetics is situated on the Health Science Campus Gastersberg in Leuven. That campus combines one of the largest university hospitals with state-of-the-art facilities for basic and translational biomedical research and for clinical trials. In the department we distinguish five broad research axes. We try to understand how the genome works, all the regulatory levels, and using different types of models including cell lines, animal models, but also where it's appropriate human subjects. In order to do that, we also invest a considerable effort in developing new technologies, both at genomics technology level and at the bioinformatic level. We actually try to understand what is the genetic variation in humans. We do that by studying human evolution, complex genetics of disease, but also by developing novel statistical methods. We as a department try to help people and educate people to reflect better on the issues at hand and even to, to support legislation wherever appropriate. So. We are now joined by Dr. Benjamin Neal. Dr. Neal, thank you so much for your time here in the studio today. Thank you. Great to be here. So first, can you tell us how genetics and genomics became central to tackling this unprecedented global pandemic? We compare people that have reported a positive COVID test against the general population, as well as looking at people that uh, ended up in hospital or in ICUs, or in some instances, individuals that have no symptoms of just a positive COVID test. In all of these analyses, we do find, you know, subtle but very reliable genetic associations. They point to interesting regions of the genome that are relevant to a variety of outcomes and biological processes, including the OAS gene cluster, which is involved in innate viral immunity, as well as um, genes that are, and variants that have been previously implicated in lung diseases like idiopathic pulmonary fibroids and interstitial lung disease. The pandemic has ushered in an era of genomic surveillance. Why is genome sequencing and surveillance important? You know, the virus is also a biological entity. Its, you know, genome made of RNA does collect mutations, and we can use those mutations to track where the virus is and also whether or not the virus might be slightly more lethal or potentially more infectious. And that genomic surveillance, that ability to see not only whether or not someone has an infection, but what variation the virus is carrying and where that infection likely came from is transformative with respect to our ability to engage in public health, in tracking, 
but it is also getting used in things like vaccine design as part of the very long pipeline to develop that next generation of vaccines to deal with COVID itself. And that's only possible with these kinds of tools in, in genomics that are you know, still relatively young in the context of biological sciences and our ability to understand the world around us. What is the focus for genetics and genomics going forward to ensure that we maintain a solid foundation for responding to COVID-19 and future national health crises? It only reinforces in me the sense that we do need to continue this commitment to working together and that, you know, the mechanisms of open science and sharing and collaboration are powerful tools in our quest to understand why people get sick and how to potentially help them deal with their illnesses or prevent infections like COVID. And I also think it underscores the challenges that we have moving from genetic discovery into biological insights. The work of the human genetics community in the coming decades needs to address this problem. How do we decode the biological consequences of genetic variation is a central problem for us. And I think the experiences with COVID have underscored how valuable those kinds of insights really could be, not only in addressing COVID, but in addressing every human disease. Dr. Neil, thank you again for joining us today and best of luck with the future. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for the opportunity to share the science. You can find ASHG TV on the front page of the meeting platform where you can browse through the playlist to watch full length versions of all the content featured in our daily show. We are also hosted on a dedicated page on the ASHG website and on our YouTube channel and Twitter. For the latest news and developments in human genetics and genomics, visit ashg.org. Finland has always been at the forefront of research into genetics, and the Finnish twin cohort studies is a great example of the work they are doing to better understand the genetic cause of disease, as well as other adverse outcomes. Let's go to the Institute of Molecular Medicine Finland, or FIM, to find out more. The Finnish twin cohort studies started in 1975. We have obtained DNA from over 13,000 twins. Our focus has been really on lifestyle factors and understanding the contribution of genes and environment. We have found that identical twins are almost always of the same body weight. When both twins have cancer, more often than not, they have cancers at different sites. We actually found that there are shared genetic factors for alcohol problems and poorer cognitive abilities. We put together results with other research groups to make very strong conclusions. We have studied in Coda twins how the genetic variation of BMI differ between different countries. FIM is an important uh, place to do this work because of the international environment in which we openly share ideas and our findings. Now for more from the United Kingdom. Earlier, we saw the role the REACT-1 study played in giving government real-time insight into the spread of the pandemic. Let's look at REACT-2 now, which aimed to track immunity through at-home antibody testing, the first time a study of this type and scale had ever been performed. The start of the pandemic was important not only just to look at the distribution of the virus in real time, but also to look at antibody response which will tell us about who'd been infected since the beginning of the pandemic. Reactive was set up extremely quickly. It was a collaboration between Imperial College, between Ipsos Mori and, and the government. The REACT2 study planned from the outset to use home use lateral flow assays. We had a number of studies to choose the best test that we trusted. We had to make sure that people could do this themselves. So we tested it with a small number of people to improve the kit and to improve the instructions particularly. When REACT2 started, the main question we had was how many people have been infected? Less than 7% after the first wave had actually antibodies in their blood. And then subsequent rounds showed us that there was some waning going on of, of antibody response. We've shown clearly the unequal burden of disease and how it's fallen on different sectors of the population. I think it's a great example of individuals being able to contribute to science and to research.
There are gaps in genetic screening for cystic fibrosis. One of the biggest hurdles is that current screening panels aren't designed to cover our diverse population. Global Diagnostics leader Assurigen is working to close this gap. Early testing for cystic fibrosis was inherently exclusive and inequitable. The mutation panels that were present when screening for cystic fibrosis started were based largely on European descent and so focused on one piece of a diverse population. When we are developing tests, implementing tests, and utilizing tests, particularly genetic tests, we need to be mindful of the diversity of our population to be sure we don't build in inequity from the start. What we have within the past few years in particular is this avalanche of new data that's come from large-scale sequencing. We're only now in a position where we can use the information to design the right test for the right group of people. That's what we're doing today. We believe that the Ampletex assay for CFTR will get this right for everybody. It's exciting to be in a position where we can provide better tests for the broad population, no matter what your heritage is. SHG and its members are dedicated to increasing awareness and appreciation of genetics and genomics research among the public and policymakers. Let's hear from Dr. Lynn Jordy, the ASHG Chair of the Government and Public Advocacy Committee, about the value and responsible use of genetic and genomic knowledge, as well as how members can get involved in advocacy. So ASHG is engaged in a number of activities uh, to promote awareness of genetics and genomics, uh, also to uh, help support funding uh, for our research. So for example, recently we participated in Hill Day where we met with representatives of a number of con uh, congressional delegations. Well, it's very important that we engage representatives from Congress and other entities because ultimately they vote on funding. They vote on, for example, the NIH budget. So we always, when we're talking with them, try to emphasize the importance of public spending on health-related research. While we're seeing genetics and genomics incorporated increasingly in medicine, uh, for example, uh, with regard to genetic testing, more and more physicians are ordering genetic tests for their patients. Uh, to diagnose more quickly and more accurately. Gene therapy is actually becoming a reality. Finding the causes of diseases, that is the genetic causes of diseases, often leads to better targeted drug therapy. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that genetics is really becoming an integral part of the practice of medicine. We also commissioned a report uh, earlier this year, supported by ASHG, on the economic benefits of human genetics and genomics research. It showed uh, that human genetics and genomics drives $265 billion a year in economic activity just in the United States. It supports 850,000 well-paying jobs. So the economic impact now of human genetics and genomics is truly enormous. Uh, to say nothing of the incredible health benefits that derive from our research. So a very important priority for the American Society of Human Genetics and for the GPAC committee is engaging uh, underserved minorities, uh, involving uh, members of those populations in our research. That is, both as participants and as investigators, uh, we encourage especially young people to become involved in human genetics and genomics research. Uh, it's vital uh, that we have as diverse a workforce as possible. Having been involved in human genetics now for several decades, one of the things I've seen is that there are many roles that one can play that contribute to our field. One of those roles is to become actively involved in policy, in advocacy, in public outreach, we have an advocates program uh, where people can become advocates uh, for human genetics and genomics research. If you go to our website, uh, you will find guidance on how to do that. 
uh, but it doesn't cost anything uh, and uh, it allows you to become uh, an even more active member of the American Society of Human Genetics. That's it for the first episode of ASHG TV. Make sure to join us tomorrow where we will look at the impact of genetics and genomics to public health and find out what ASHG is doing to promote public engagement within the field. And remember, you can find us on the front page of the meeting platform, as well as on our YouTube channel and Twitter feed. We will see you right back here tomorrow. Thanks for joining us.